Good morning. Um, I'm John. I'm from Stripe. And I'm going to tell you just a little bit today about what we've built and what we're thinking about uh, in the future. Um, and there's just one thing I want to let you know about my speech. I was looking over it just before I came on stage. And uh, I noticed there was not, I noticed an omission, there was not a single NSA or PRISM joke uh, in the entire speech. Uh, and so you guys are going to have to, not one, so you guys are going to have to make up your own NSA jokes as we go along. And you'll be parsing the speech and like, ah, just like PRISM. Um, so, a Stripe. Um, Stripe is a service that allows you to accept payments online. Uh, you sign up for an account with us. Um, you provide us a few details on your business. You integrate Stripe's API with your website or your mobile app. Uh, and then you start charging money. Uh, and it hits your bank account uh, a few days later. It's just that simple. But we started building Stripe in late 2009. Uh, and it launched publicly in late 2011. Um, and when we built the first version of Stripe, uh, we built the thing that we ourselves as developers wanted, the infrastructure that we would find useful. Uh, and we knew it would be good for us, but we didn't quite know what people would go and build with it. Um, and over the past two years, tens of thousands of businesses have started building with Stripe. So let me show you a little bit uh, of what they've done. You have some traditional retail people selling stickers or watches to a wide audience. You've uh, nonprofits, the EFF or, or change.org, uh, started accepting online donations using Stripe. Uh, you've monetization for publishers, uh, you know, old and new companies finding new business models online. No wired, I noticed there, David. Um, you have every conceivable kind of online software generally sold as a subscription uh, to do things from manage your finance to track your fitness. Um, but we also have seen new kinds of commerce happening. Uh, businesses that could only be created online and business models that couldn't have worked 10 years ago. So Udemy is using Stripe um, to uh, allow instructors uh, to create courses all over the world. And then Udemy students can use the app. Uh, they pay for those courses. They can learn at their leisure. Uh, and this supports courses that mightn't have been available um, you know, they mightn't support a physical class. Uh, Form Labs is using Stripe to <coughs> fund the development uh, of their new 3D printer. Uh, and so uh, this printer uses uh, stereolithography rather than the traditional extrusion methods. Uh, it's much more precise, much more accurate. Uh, but traditionally, this method was very expensive. And so th they're developing a low-cost printer. It'll ship in October, but they're accepting uh, pre-orders from early adopters right now. Uh, Lyft is using Stripe to build a ride-sharing network uh, out of everyday people. These aren't cabs, these are people working part-time or, or maybe full-time. Uh, and the app matches passengers and drivers on a, on a smart basis. And the driver doesn't even need a credit card reader. All the payments are taken care of within the app. You get out of the car at the end, you rate your driver, uh, and the payment happens automatically. Um, and we could never have predicted any of these use cases. And we're always careful to remember that. Our idea with Stripe is to give developers complete control over the product experience. We don't require that you redirect to Stripe or that payments happen in a certain way. The app owns the experience and the branding the whole way through. And this leads to uh, better experiences in payments. Um, I, I think five years ago, everyone thought that the way payments would happen in cabs would be you'd take out your wallet and tap your NFC card uh, on the reader. And it took apps like Lyft to show us that actually that's not how the payment experience works at all. The payment experience works with you never taking your wallet out of your pocket. Uh, and Stripe in return changes in response to what people build with it. So we noticed six months ago that uh, some of the fastest growing companies uh, were still doing lots of manual work. Uh, for payments, uh, and especially when, in, when it involved uh, dispersing money on the back end. And so, uh, say with Lyft, they would charge a customer for a ride, and then one of the staff would have to go log into the bank portal and send a check to the driver. And so we said, okay, how do we make Stripe actually support this? Uh, and so now, when you charge a card with Stripe, you can specify any number of recipients and any breakdown for the funds to go to those bank accounts. 
Uh, and so we made it as easy with Stripe to charge money on behalf of multiple people as to, to charge money for yourself. Uh, so you have this cycle where Stripe gives developers complete freedom in the paid products they build. Uh, and in return, those products shape the direction of the platform and improve it. Uh, so that's where Stripe is now. Uh, all these businesses are building really interesting things with us. We're processing millions of dollars a day in aggregate. Uh, and our thesis is that better payment infrastructure leads to more things being created, more businesses started, uh, and more exchanges happening. Um, but there are still big problems with online payments. There's a lot to be fixed. And that's what we're focusing on for the next few years with Stripe. Uh, and so to explain, I'm going to rewind a little bit. I never expected to, uh, to find myself working on Stripe. Back in 2009, I was in college in Boston. Uh, and Patrick, my brother, who I, who I started Stripe with, uh, Patrick and I had previously built web products. And we'd noticed that you know, there, were, there were great tools for, for building those products, great software frameworks. Uh, there were great tools for hosting those products and delivering them to the customer, uh, things like AWS and Heroku. But, but then when you actually want, went to, to realize value from that, to charge money for it, that was extraordinarily hard. Uh, so I'm not sure if the slides are now missing some slides. Um, so we built the, the simplest product we could imagine. Uh, we built uh, an API for accepting credit cards. Uh, and that was actually a big shift. For the first time, it was just as easy to integrate uh, payments into your apps or website as a YouTube video. You didn't have to fight with a merchant account provider or ship your users off to PayPal. You, know, you didn't need to uh, fill out a bunch of paperwork and wait weeks for it to be improved, or, sorry, for it to be approved. Uh, but we didn't quite know how to make the product work. We didn't know how to charge credit cards uh, en masse on behalf of merchants. For a while, we, we thought we needed a banking license. Uh, and eventually, in, you know, we figured out the financial partners we needed to work with, and we, uh, we signed our first financial partnership in uh, December 2010. Uh, and that was the year that we also raised our first investment. Um, two of our very early investors were Peter Thiel and Mark Andreessen. Um, and you know, it's always going to be a, an interesting conversation when you walk into an office with the, the founder of PayPal. And you're like, so, online payments, completely broken, right? <laughs> uh, and Mark, as you know, um, he's the founder of Netscape, the first major internet browser. Uh, and when we told him what we were building at Stripe, he, he very quickly got the idea. Uh, and he told us how in the very first version of HTML, the markup language that sits underneath the whole web we use, in that first version of HTML, they wanted to have a payment tag. Uh, but they couldn't get everything in place in time. And th the payment tag would have been a, a universal standardized mechanism for online payments. And, and that's kinda, that kind of sums up what's wrong with online payments today. 20 years later, we're still waiting for our payment tag. Rather than having a, a universal means for online payments, uh, they're still cumbersome and fragmented. You can see the symptoms everywhere you look. Uh, the payment, how the payment systems we have in place today are, are holding back online commerce. If, if you go buy a piece of software on the App Store today, you click buy, maybe enter your password, and that's more or less it. If you go buy the, the same piece of software on the web, you're filling out 10 or 20 form fields, and that's just the first page of the checkout. You'll probably then get redirected to verified by Visa, so you can get confused and give up. Um, so there's a huge amount of friction if you're going to buy the software with a credit card. And that's actually assuming you can. If you're buying from Germany or India, uh, you mightn't have a credit card. It's 2013, and to buy a piece of software online, many of people either won't or just can't. And think about that for a second. This doesn't happen in coffee shops or retail stores. Payments offline are pretty quick, easy, and your payment instrument is always supported. The internet has made it very easy for people to communicate, but paying online is still inefficient and still fragmented. The payment networks we use are fractured, and as a result, the internet gets fractured as well. It, but it doesn't have to be this way. Like I said, Offline payments don't have this problem. And, and we do have precedent for complex, heterogeneous networks interconnecting. The internet itself is a testament to this, uh, a global network of networks where any computer can reach another computer with just an IP address. Uh, it's easy to get on the network, and it's easy to transfer information across it. 
In online payments, we talk about different networks and payment instruments all the time, but on the internet, we don't talk about different kinds of IP addresses. What if our payment infrastructure was designed like the internet? What if it had inner connectivity and user experience as the goals? This is what we're working on for the next few years at Stripe, designing payment infrastructure from the ground up for the internet. And of course, it's still very early days for Stripe. We haven't achieved this yet, but we're getting there. We're up and running in four countries. We have a private beta in the UK. We'll be adding more countries this year, and we expect that more payment instruments will follow as we spread. And the reason this problem, allowing everyone to transact easily with each other, the reason this problem is so important is the web economy has so much growth left in it. This, this is a huge opportunity. Um, and I want to talk briefly about two figures that tell that story. The first is the number of broadband connections. The number of broadband connections is, uh, is a decent proxy for general internet connectivity. And even though we think of the internet as widespread already, um, the number of broadband connections is going to 20x between 2005 and 2015. By 2015, we'll have close to 3 billion consumer internet or consumer broadband connections. Um, and much of this, as you can imagine, is due to growth in, in mobile and, uh, and growth outside the developed world. And the other figure I want to look at is the fraction of global consumer spending that happens online. Uh, right now, you know, it's, it's a little bit hard to place that figure, but right now most estimates place it at around 2%. Uh, and if you compare that 2% with the amount of time you spend online and the amount of value you get from online service, it seems a little out of whack. Like, it's hard to predict where that number will end up in the steady state, uh, but it's not 2%, maybe 30% or 50%. And so then when you look at these two numbers together, that we have a 20x increase in broadband connections this decade, and yet now only 2% of global consumer spending happens online, uh, it's clear there's a shift happening. The online commerce we've seen up to now is nothing compared to the online commerce we're going to see. And this next stage of online commerce is going to come from entrepreneurs just like the people in this room. People today are building online services that nobody 10 years ago could ever have conceived of. So it's a pretty safe bet that we can't conceive of all the online businesses that'll happen 10 years from now. To make, to make this next stage of online commerce possible, we need better payment infrastructure underlying it. Um, that's what we're building here at Stripe, and we can't wait to see what you build with it. Thank you. So John, I saw a tweet a little while ago that said, in the last 48 hours, more money has passed through your network than in the first two years of the business, which is not a bad growth curve. <laughs> What's the particular secret to that? So Stripe has an interesting phenomenon in its figures where we have, we have kind of two growth curves overlaid. So we're acquiring businesses on our growth curve, uh, and there's actually exponential growth factors at play there, which you, you mightn't have expected. But those, business, those aren't like normal users. Those businesses aren't standing still. Those themselves are startups, and they're following their own exponential growth curves. And so you have these two curves overlaid, uh, which is pretty nice for growth. When you look at transaction volume, we have both the growth of Stripe as a platform onboarding all these, all these businesses and all these products, and then the growth within those products themselves. So I thought you were going to say it's about simplicity. It's about, it's all about fast all that too. server yeah. response. Right. Um, but I'm, I, a lot of people here would like that kind of growth rate. So one piece of advice for the room. I think one of the things, yeah, it's like I said, it's still very early days for Stripe, and I, it's hard to draw very many generalizations. But I think the core thing for Stripe was that we went very directly after the creators. You know, we didn't go after the business folks or the, the managers or anything. We went after the people building websites and building apps. And we said that you know, this was a market that previously um, had been ignored. Uh, and, uh, and now we're seeing all this kind of movement around. But we went after the people who were uh, like building the apps themselves. And we said that would kind of trickle upwards. And it has. May the rest of you have Stripe's growth rate. Thank you very much, John. Thank you.